Welcome back, y'all. You know what it is, the voice of the culture. I'm here, back with another great season ahead of me. Starting it off with someone that's just, man, her family is legendary. Her father is, is the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Willie Berger himself. But today, I'm sitting down with the infamous Miss Tanya. And she has done so many great things outside of being just his daughter. She just kept the legacy going. And um, we're going to start off with her beginnings and her story. But um, first and foremost, Tanya, I got to welcome you to the round table. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. We live. We're here in D.C. So just for the, car, the culture to understand, we had to run out here and catch up with you. But it was all worth it. It's all and good. we appreciate the opportunity. But um, let's jump right into the life, the legend himself, your dad. Mm-hmm. Miss Tanya, welcome. And uh, I got one first question I have to ask you. How was it being the daughter of the man, the myth, the legendary Mr. Willie Burgess? Ah, very good question. And I call him Willie Burgess. <laughs> you know what I mean? I have to give him that. Him you know that. what I mean? A lot of people call him that. But how was it as a, you know, the daughter, the child? I know you've seen a lot, been through a lot. Yeah. Saw it all. Yeah. Been behind the grill. Yep. Yeah. Been when the, it was in the building when the when the lights was off. Mm hmm How was it growing up? Hmm. I would say it was. How can I put this? It was awesome. I would say that it was awesome because there was never a dull moment with my father. Yeah, it was never a dull to moment. That's why I you that first. Yeah. He was always the life of the party. He always was, he was a thinker, so he was always thinking about something else to do, something to better himself, better his businesses. So that's just how he was, and I think that I picked that up from him. Right. As you can see, we have the backdrop, the book, the clothing line, so you just kept the hustle going. I kept the hustle going. Now, siblings, how many of it was you, of you guys? Well, I have two siblings by my mother. Okay. And I have... Five sisters, or is it four? Maybe it's four, four or five sisters outside of my father and mother's marriage. Okay, how many were in the house with you guys? I would say that then. In my house, just me, my brother Eric, and my sister Sabrina. Okay, and you are out of the three? I'm the youngest. Wow, I knew that, but the culture didn't understand that. That's mm -hmm. why I asked you, how was it growing up being the baby mm -hmm. of the, the family? Daddy's girl. Exactly, you was the one that was in the front seat. Mm -hmm. When dad was riding around. Mm -hmm. Now, it started off in your father came. He's not from Harlem. He came from Harlem by way of? North Carolina. Okay. And what year did he move into uh, the Mecca? Hmm. I would just say this. What my aunt said was as soon as he turned 18, he left the South. He mm. took off. He took off. As soon as he was of age to leave the South, he was ready. Now, was your mother from the South as well? My mother's from South Carolina. My father's from North Carolina. It's funny how that always comes together. Yeah, but they met, they met in Brooklyn. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> my parents came from the South together. So yeah. it's funny how that generation, that era, everybody kind of rolled the, yeah, they they rolled the wave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know what I mean? So they met in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. How was that? Because I know, I know your mother has some stories. I know your father yeah. has some stories. My, my mother said that he used to follow her a lot in school because she had long, pretty Indian hair, like down her back. And um, she used to go to the basketball game sometimes, and the boys would play in her hair. Right. And he, he used to creep up there and be watching her, and she didn't know it. Was he older than your, your he's mom? Older. He's older. Okay. Yeah, he's older than my mom. And he would say, when she would be walking home, he would say, I saw them boys playing in your hair. What I told you about letting them guys play in your hair. She said he would say little things like that to her. So you he know, already he, had in his mind what he was going after. Yeah, yeah. So would you say your father was a visionary? Yes, very okay. much so. And I'm just saying that because just the small story about him with pursuing your mother mm -hmm. allowed him to pursue his dreams in life. Mm -hmm. Now as time progressed, your mother and your father, they, they become one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Harlem now. Yes. What year was it for you when you realized, as the baby, what was going on in, at home? Like, dad's not working. Dad's not the garbage man. 
let's just say that, you know, when wow. we kids, we going to school, my mm -hmm. dad's a garbage man, my dad were, and basically back then the garbage man was everything. Mm -hmm. So that's why I said that, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Watching that grow up had to be fascinating, you know yeah. what I mean? Because it was like your dad was a man amongst people. Okay, my, my father was a carpenter, mm. so he was always very good with his hands. Right. So when we migrated, when they moved, when we was in New York, he used to build a lot of things. So he was self-taught and a lot of things. He didn't never look at blueprints. Right. He would go in the room, look around, take a few measurements, and that was it. And right. he would make it happen. Okay. So he was, he was gifted that way. That was his gift. Now, hands. let's talk about that because being naturally gifted leads you in different directions in life. Yes. And I believe that's where it led your father because him coming from the South, they always, I, one thing I learned from my father, they come from the South, but they have an idea, they have a plan. Mm -hmm. Did your father really tell you the original plan that he wanted to do before he got into whatever he might have, it took him to do? No, but I do discuss parts in my book about, because my, my father and I were very close. I was a daddy's girl. Right. And a lot of people know that. Um, so growing up, he, he used to come into my room a lot at night or, or, and talk to me about certain things throughout his day, how his day was. Right. And he used to always tell me, like if he was gonna open up a new business, sometimes he would let me know in advance what he was gonna do. Right. So he, he kept me in the loop, even though I was the youngest. I really didn't know what was going on, but we were close like that. Right. So I, I love that rapport that we had, father daughter relationship. Right. That, that's amazing, too, because at the end of the day, it's funny. You would think I would think your brother would have been the one kind of pursuing a little bit more harder. But I seems like you personally with the book, mm -hmm. the merch, mm -hmm. you popping up at different events that's representing the 80s and the 90s that was so that the willy burgers as you see was so epic for us growing up that culture it's like you just kind of just pivoted off your what your father was doing mm -hmm. and that led you in a different directions and as a young lady mm -hmm. sometimes they don't always grasp that yeah you might want to take your own route that's true you know what i mean that's true so as time progress when did you i gotta ask you this your father's very first what was his very first and let's tell a culture that don't know the spots your father also had. Like, a lot of people just think Willie's, Willie Burgers. Some no, people he, don't know about the other ones, you know what I mean? He had a lot of them, and they're also mentioned on my, my Brewington Cloth website and also in my book. Um, his very first business was called Willie's Fast Foods, and that was on a hundred... It was between 111th and 112th Street and 7th Avenue. Okay. Which we used to live in 111th Street on the 7th Avenue side, between 7th and 8th, but we lived on the corner. Okay. So when he decided to open up his very first food business, he decided to go back to the hood where we were from. Mm. And, and I thought that that was a very creative idea and thoughtful idea for him to open up a fast food restaurant in that area because there was nothing like that in that area. What year was this? Ooh, this was back in the 80s. I would say 84, 85. Okay. Because I was just coming out of high school. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, after that location, that shut down. And let's talk about Willie's Lounge. Willie's Lounge. Willie's Lounge. That was back in the 80s too. I can't give you an exact date. That was right. back in the 80s also. But after the Willie's Fast Foods, he was building, he was in the process of, of building the Willie's Burgers. So he already knew he was going he to found 45th. A, he found a spot. Um, it's mentioned in my book also. I'm going to keep referencing my book. As you should, because that, we need the culture to understand it. it. Right. That book is it. And please, go get the book. You see the, the drop in the back. It's yeah, written. My, it talks about everything. Yeah, my book is the plug. Um, he, there was a, a, a man, where the hamburger stand was located, there was a man that used to sit there for years and sell newspapers. Mm. And... Um, one day we drove past and he was like, I'm going to put a hamburger stand right there. And I'm looking at him like he's crazy because all I see is a wall. 
Exactly. So, you know, him being a carpenter and having such a creative mind, he saw things I didn't see. Right. So um, I'm looking at him like he's crazy. I said, that man been there for years. How are you going to get that man to move from that corner? He said, <laughs> money makes everybody. Move. Money makes the world go around, especially in Harlem. So um, next thing I know, the man was started, I think he started selling newspapers across the street. He moved across the street. And my father started building a hamburger stand from the wall, out from the wall, on the side of a, like a bodega on the corner. Exactly. So the thing about it, my question to you was, the first spot that he had, the eating spot, could you eat inside? Yes. Willie's Fast Foods, yes, you could okay. eat inside. It was like a fast food joint. Come in, get your fish and chips, and um, your, whatever you're ordering. Some people ate inside. Some people just got their food to go. So he had us all in there. We right. were all in there. Everybody's working. Family, all that. We was all in there. Well, he knew to keep it in-house. In yeah. And the reason why I asked that question, because the infamous Willie Burgers to that that a lot of people know now of, and the part that I realized that, you know, I was a part of, you couldn't eat inside. Yes. Like you just had to go there mm -hmm. and get it. And mm -hmm. I think that was the uniqueness of that whole situation. Mm -hmm. Because honestly, we didn't know half of the people that, you didn't know who was behind that wall <laughs> and who was behind that little glass, mm -hmm. but yo, know, it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. You know, back then, nobody was skeptical. You know, nowadays, mm -hmm. everybody's not going to spots like this. Well, mm -hmm. who's behind, especially just coming out of COVID, everything yeah. going on. But back then, it didn't matter. Yeah. You know what I mean? But the question that I have to ask about the Willie Burger situation is this. He allowed it to go. He knew how long to keep it open as far as late night hours. And I think that was like... That had to be genius to say, you know what, I'm going to keep this spot open at 3, 4 in the morning. He kept that joint open 24 hours. How are he you said running the staff? He's not. Shut. So you mean to tell me y'all never shut, that was never shut down? Never. Wow. 24 hours. If it was ever a case where there was nobody there, either there was an emergency or we couldn't really get the help because everybody was burnt out. Right, because you know, let's, let's be clear, those burgers was moving. Yeah, we were standing on our feet for hours. We didn't have a, a, a time shift. We had a crowd shift. Yes. That's how we moved. But your father knew that. That's how we was operating. I think that was the most genius part about it all, because no matter what we did at the end of the night, yo, we got to go to Willie's. And Willie's, let's not, let's be clear, it wasn't just a New York thing. Everybody from my era growing up in Inglewood, yo, we going to Willie's, we going to Willie's. And at the time, me and my team, we didn't even have cars. But if we <laughs> can get in the car to go to Willie's just to get a burger to say, hey, I'm staying, I'm at Willie's. Mm -hmm. And this is before the Instagram, the social media. Mm -hmm. It's, yo, you just had to be there. But the thing about it is, it was no not. Every time I was out there, I never saw no BS go, take place out there. Oh, there was there was a bunch. Of I that mean, I'm going. quite sure it was, but I'm just yeah. saying. Also, the respect for the person that owned it, mm -hmm. people paid homage to that. Mm -hmm. We were never robbed, never. Wow. Never robbed, never. I don't even think anyone even attempted, attempted. to. Yeah, only one person, and I discussed that in my book also, that it was a crackhead. I'm just going to say he was a crackhead. Right. I don't know if he was. Maybe it could just be a man that was broke and hungry. Right. And he climbed into the window. And Y'all were stole, closed? We were closed that day, and he stole the safe that was in there. It only had like about $400, $500. Now, this, now, like you just said, you very rarely ever closed mm -hmm. so that just happened to be yeah. that time yeah so that was the only time and i don't know how the hell he got that safe out that window but out he that did. little window it now you had to be there to understand the window <laughs> the safe wasn't really big but i thought the safe was bigger than the window but he got it out of that window wow wow yeah wow let's talk about the rooftop the infamous. The infamous rooftop. The rooftop was back in the 80s also. A lot of this was going on while I was graduating from high school, okay. coming out of high school. So that's when I started really going over the George Washington Bridge. Because now you're relocated to Teaneck. No, we was in Teaneck the entire time all of this was being Oh, built. okay, okay. 
we was in Teaneck, and I discussed like my father earlier years versus um, when we moved to Jersey when he came home from jail and he was working and then we decided that we were going to move to Teaneck, New Jersey. He told us let's go and we was out and we was in Teaneck ever since. So all of this was happening while we were in Teaneck. Wow. And what was funny was not to jump around but huh. coming from when I used to also go to the rink and hang out with my friends at the rink, really coming down the block on Teaneck Road, all I had to do was go a couple of blocks and, 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 and make a, a left, and I was home. But you but passed be, that. But because <laughs> I didn't want nobody knowing where I lived, except for people that was from Jersey right. or that knew me, I would bypass my house right. and go another route and go home. So As you, you should, though. Yeah, you at that time, gotta, you always got to stay on your toes. Well, that, you know, that's your father being who he was. Yeah, that was taught at home. Yes, you know what I mean. That that was taught at home. Now, seeing seeing that you're a part of it, and see, when I say a part of it, you're witnessing, you're hearing it. Yeah, it, it, you're not blind to the fact of who your father is and what he stands on. Did it ever affect you growing up? Was you ever like, why is daddy never home? Yes, okay. and that's also mentioned in my book. So it's like a lot of key things you're hitting on. I went there with that book. That right. My book is raw. If it right. wasn't for Willie, it's raw. Um, I give you everything. There were, this book was therapeutic for me. Mm. It was a healing process also for me because he was never home. He was never home. And I used to always argue with him about that. Mm. You're never home. And I know if I argue with him, I can hear my mother sometimes arguing with him, you know, about certain things and he was never there. But not jumping around, but at his viewing, when he passed away, I got my answer as to why he was never home. So when I was sitting there, it's like a light bulb went off in my head as to why he was never home. Because he was a father to many people. He was a father to people that I don't even know. Mm. There were so many guys that stood up at his viewing that I've never seen before. And everyone started out when they first started talking if it wasn't for Willie. So that's where I got the title of my book right. from. That stuck with me. Before they would say anything, they was like, if it wasn't for Willie, if it wasn't for Willie. But it was. It was two young men who really spoke that really captured my heart, but one of the guys turned around and looked directly at me. And what he said was, if it wasn't for your father, I don't know where I would be because your father was my father. And he said, and thank you for sharing your father with the world. Mm. Because he said, I, don't, I never knew who my father was. And your father took care of me like a son. Wow. And that's this how you saying wow? That's how I was. Wow. Yeah, because at the end of the day, you really don't understand, you know, outside of home. I mean, I ain't going to say you don't understand. You might have a, a, a little bit, mm -hmm. but that love that he gave to the community mm -hmm. is priceless. Because like you said, you got these, and these ain't young kids. These are grown men saying this yeah. at the time. These yeah. are not kids. These no. are men. Grown men. Not even forgetting... The opportunity, and I'm quite sure your father gave plenty of people many opportunities. We're not going to get yeah. into that. Yeah. You done seen a million people come and go. That's where the story comes from. And, and also in my book, there was a part in my book where I felt that it was empty. It needed something else. Right. So I thought about it for a few days, and I spoke to my ghostwriter, and I decided to, for her to interview people that knew my father, that worked for my father. And she thought that was a brilliant idea. Although she did charge me extra of course, for that. Of course, of <laughs> course. But she interviewed people. Now, I was not privy to what was discussed or what questions were asked. Right. I just gave the contact information and she took it from there. So after she would finish that interview, she would send me you know, what the interview was about. She sent me, she wrote up everything and sent it to me. I found out more things about my father from her interviewing other people than I even knew about my father at all. Wow. 
So you could grow up with somebody, be in the household with him. Right. You know, he raised me, but he was in the street. That's the difference between sometimes a father that stays home all the time and always home versus a father that's home and also in the street. Right. So there's a difference. The obligations are the totally obligations different. The obligations are totally different and you're raised different. Right. And sometimes, you know, the streets take more privilege, take more than the home. Yes. Take, you know, the, the weight that weighs more than the home because the obligations are a lot more. Mm -hmm. And it's weird to say that, but it's the truth. Yes, it is. You know what I mean? But at the same time, y'all adjusted to that. We had no choice. Mm. My father didn't. He allowed us to be ourselves, um, but he he never wanted us to be punks. Let's just say that. Right. He 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 made sure we was kind of, you know, we could stand our ground. As you should, though. And that makes me the woman I am today. Uh, yeah, yeah. Congratulations to that too, because at the end of the day, knowledge is infinite. So what he taught you then. You probably didn't, you know, really grasp it mm -hmm. until you got to a certain point. Okay. Exactly. Uh, I, I got it. Exactly. You know what I mean? And that's probably what he was doing with every, and not probably, that's what he was doing with everybody else. Mm -hmm. So that's why he was so, your father was really everywhere. He was stretched out. Yes, he was. You know what I mean? That's now, why he was never home. Right. Now, did you ever think that took a toll on him? Did you ever see that taking a toll on him personally? Because sometimes, you yes. know, we, oh, so you I saw that. I would say, that. yeah. There were times that he would come home and he was dead tired. I remember one time just jumping around when um, he had the SNS. So the SNS was a, a social club after our spot. You had to know someone to get in there. Let's talk if about you it. Didn't, if you didn't know nobody, if you got in there and didn't know nobody or people, not, nobody, if, you felt, if they felt funny, you, wasn't you had to in. leave. And I know that there was one occasion where that happened. They, my father had a friend that came home from prison and um, his cousin, and he allowed him to be on the door. And he let somebody in that nobody really knew. So that I, from my understanding, they asked the guy to leave. And... Um, I guess he felt some kind of way, you know. I, I know I would have. I'm trying exactly. to come in the joint. A spot a that's popping. Yeah. Well known. And from my understanding, he came back upstairs and he killed my father's cousin that was at the door. Wow. So, yeah. Well, back then, it, I mean, we're dealing with straight gangsters, too. Let's yeah, just be clear. True. You know, we're not playing with knives. We're playing with real live killers and murderers. And, you know, back then it was do or die. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Reputation was everything. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So definitely is a whole nother different timing. But your father embraced that though. Yeah, he knew he, that he, he knew hurt. that came with the game. Yeah, but he was he was that's when I really saw him. He was hurt behind that. Right. That hurt him to his core. Because although my father was in the street a lot, he was not a violent man. Exactly. He wasn't he didn't, he didn't like violence. He didn't want it around him. He was a very humble man. Although he, he could turn into two different people at course, any time. Of course, he has to. So he could flip the coin at any time, but he was a very humble person. So by someone doing that, really, it really hurt him to his core. He was down for a while after that. He was down for a while because he had to bury him. He just came home and he had to bury him. Right. He had to call his family, you know, right. thinking that he's trying to help him get on his feet. Because he was the go-to person. When you came home. If somebody came home. He had multiple locations, spots. He had, he had businesses. No question, he would give you a job, create a job for you. Right. And that's just who he was as a mm -hmm. person. But you know one thing about your father that I always was curious to know, is like he always catered to the culture. Always. And he always catered to like to the younger crowd. Like mm -hmm. he, for, and I'm going to say us. Like he's like, I want y'all to have a spot to have fun, chill, enjoy. Like he knew what would, he knew the people, mm -hmm. but he wanted. Nah, I don't, cause he could have catered to his his age band, his age group. He, he did. He did he, a little with, everything. Did, yeah, but you know, most, and I'm only going by what mm -hmm. my era saw. Mm -hmm. I saw us. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I'm quite sure the SNS back then was for the old the OGs and all that, mm -hmm. and the Willie's lounges. But like the rooftop and the Willie's, like who would think you were standing in front of a a burger joint and, and, and just stay there for hours. 
Who's doing that in 2023? Nobody. I, I think the kind of the key to that, kind of, sort of, it was the culture, it was the environment. Right. Um, and also, we got to pay homage to Kid Capri because he was there on the side of the hamburger stand. That's where he started out with his little mixtapes. Wow. He came in over there one day, and it's discussed in my book. I even paid homage to him by giving him his own chapter called The Kid. Um, and if it, by him being there, it was like a one-stop shop. You copped your burgers. Your mixtape. Your mixtape. Go to the car. Go to the bodega. Go to the bodega. Go to the weed spot across. There you go. And you just stood out there. Get your you, car washed. You, you get your car washed. You put your tape in. You listen to your tape, eating your burgers. That was genius, though. And with you your look, crew. With your crew. The lady And the ladies would come through because they knew this is where all the hustlers exactly. going to come. They was out there in their finest. Yeah. Fact, we, on the corner. On the corner. And, 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 and all weather. Yeah. Let's be clear. The weather didn't stop it. Oh, weather <laughs> is summer, it's uh, winter, and it's 20 below. I'm not going. No, we stand in front. Of, we got our minks on. We got our coats. Mm -hmm. It was the show-off scene for the culture. Same thing with the rooftop. Yo, I want to, I got to be in there. I want to be the say, and it's funny because now everything, you go everywhere. Everybody got a phone up. I can imagine if we could have did that back then, mm -hmm. what you would have saw back then because you had to be there. You had to be there. I mean, we could discuss this and talk about this all day long, but if you was not a part of that era, I think that was the best era of all time. Of all times growing up, I really do because we. It was like it was a culture. If 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 my mother saw somebody else's child on our block doing something they wasn't supposed to, she could. Whip check his, them right whip there his on the ass, spot. Check him and take him home, and his mother would be okay with it. Can't do that now. Or either, or even worse, we would straighten our ass up until you got off that. Okay, she's gone. Let's get back to our monkey there shit. There you go. It was, and it was more respect back then too. Mm -hmm. The respect for the generations was totally different than man totally. now. Totally. You might get a young kid to tell you f you. What you get out of here? You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think you know that what makes what you did what your father did, what he established, mm -hmm. makes it so iconic. Mm -hmm. And that's something I want to talk to you about because now here you are. You're iconic. Mm -hmm. We got the merch. We got the, if it wasn't for Willie's, we got the year, we got the book. Now, I want to dab into the book. What made you decide to write this book? Because I'm quite sure it was an up and down situation. It was. I... Personally, because now you're putting certain things out to the world, not to cut you off, there you go. but you're also dealing with personal issues that mm -hmm. people don't know. Because at the end of the day, if we don't, people only know what you see. That's true. We see you up and down eighth. We see you here. We see you there. We don't see the home and no. the years and the, you know, you mentioned your pops doing some, you know, some time and not being home. Years later, decades later, you decide to let the world get a small taste of basically the inside yeah, and not everybody just kind of being on the outside. What made you decide to take that leap? I decided, I started writing a journal back in what, 2017 during the COVID era. Okay. And um, you know, when everything shut down. That was about 2020 though. Yeah. I don't want the culture, I'm like sorry. 17. I'm right. sorry. <laughs> but I started my journal, journal in, in 2017. 2017. Okay. So. Um, during the COVID, um, when everything shut down, um, what I decided to do was I decided to write a journal and I started to make it to where I can let go of everything that was bothering me or whatever over so the years. Would... Just put it in my journal, okay. pour it in my journal. And I had that journal for years. So there was times that I would write in it and then there was times that I didn't write in it. So it, the journal was my book. So what happened was a, 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 a homegirl of mine came over and she was, re I had the, my laptop open and she started reading some Your of laptop. it. Your laptop. Yeah, so, so she said, you should write a book. And I was like, get out of here, I ain't writing no book. That's my personal journal. 
And um, she said, no, but I'm serious. You should write a book. So what happened was one day I got off of work and I just decided, you know what, let me find, start. I'm the type of person, if I want to do something, I'm going to read up on it. I'm, right. I'm on the internet. You're going to do your homework. I'm doing my homework. I found a ghostwriter. And I wanted to find a particular ghostwriter that didn't really know about Willie Burgers, mm. didn't know um, who my father was, and I found someone. Why, though? Because that person would be biased. That person wouldn't tell me, you should put this in, and you should put that. She was very open. Once I told her about, once I did my introduction with her and told her who I was, and she asked me certain questions, and she asked me at the very first interview, what do you want the title of the book to be? And I said, if it wasn't for Willie. And she said, why? And then I explained why. She said, this is it. So I gave her access to my journal. I gave her my password, everything. And I told her to read it and get back to me the next day. The next day I contacted her. I said, so what did you think? She said, I'm going to be honest with you. She said, you already wrote your whole book. Wow. She said, and I'm wondering why are you hiring me? I said, because I've never written a book before and I wanted somebody who had that knowledge that can you know, keep me focused and, and make it happen. So she made it happen for me. She made it happen. She did a great job too. Yes, she did. Yes, she, she did a did. great job to, to cover everything. Shout out to well. Angie. Shout out to Angie for that too. <laughs> now, you dab into the book. I'm going to ask you a few things about that. Were you concerned about family members feeling a certain type of way about things that you wrote? Because, you know, yeah, family. Yes and no. Okay. Yes and no. And I understand that because it's, um, we all grown. Yeah. But, you know, it's still that balance mm -hmm. and that respect, you know what I mean, of, you know, growing up. I'm quite sure a sibling. And you being the baby, that's why you being the baby mm -hmm. addressing all this. Well, what I decided to do was keep all of my family out of it. This mm -hmm. was my relationship okay. with my father. Okay. So nobody can't tell me about my relationship with my father. None of my siblings can do that. I think that was very smart. They can have an idea, they can comment, but this was my relationship with my father, and that's what I wanted to talk about. Because now it's not everybody else's point of view, it's your straight point Just of view. It's my point of because view. Because he had a different relationship with each and every one of you yes, differently. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Okay. So I wanted to keep that the focal point of my book. And I stressed that with her. And she told me that was very smart because I wasn't stepping on anyone's toes. Right. You know, there might be things in there that they don't like that I said about him, but I was honest. There was times I didn't like him. There were times where me and my father didn't speak for years. There's things that I saw I didn't like. And right. I kind of shut down from him. Right. And um, that part was hard for me to write about, you know, because she was trying to talk to me and get certain things out of me, the ghostwriter, while she was writing. And there were times that I cried because I'm human. And he wasn't a perfect father, but he didn't have to be perfect because no one's perfect. Right. But he was a great father. Yes. And a great man. Yes. So... When I released all of that, it was therapeutic for me, you know? He wasn't always there. He wasn't the greatest father. But the, as, a, as a child, when you grow up, when you, when you grow up, you, need, you have to learn to reconcile and accept people for who they are. That's who he was. My father was a hustler. Your father was Harlem. Yeah. Let's really be clear. Yeah. And I feel like what your father did for Harlem is, is I think, and I could be wrong, but I'm, I'm a thinker. Just certain locations where he had different spots, it's like those spots were the spots. So it's like he saw that. Okay, we're going to put this here because it's this amount of traffic coming from here. We're going to put this here because we got this amount of traffic here. We're going to cater to these people over here because we know we're having this rooftop. We ain't got to worry about the community around it having any issues outside with the traffic. Mm -hmm. I think it was all clever thinking. Yes, it was. And, and what I will say is his name was his brand. Of course. All of his businesses had his name on it. 
Why do you do that? Because his name was his brand. And once you go to one location and you get the vibe of it and you liked it, then if he builds something else, you're following that name. That's what they're following, that name. I, well, this place was the bomb. So, so I'm going to go to this spot because I already know yo, you that know, place Willie's got a new bomb. spot over there. There you go. Here. There you go. Yo, we got to go try them out. Yep. So that's his name was his brand. And you know what? Back then, your word, your name was everything. Yes. Let's, let's be clear. That era mm -hmm. and that time, your name was everything. Mm -hmm. we, you know what I mean? I'm quite sure you had those, you and your siblings. That's Willie's daughter. Mm -hmm. That's Willie's daughter. Or, I, or people call me Lil Willie. Right. Nobody so you had knew street, my name. You had street security that you probably didn't even know about. Ooh, speaking of that, there's, there's also things that I discuss in the book about that, like certain situations, certain establishments I was at, and things happened. And then there would be someone approach me and say, don't worry about it. I know your father. Everything is okay. And just walk off. I'm I don't, quite sure I didn't already. know these people. Right. Never you seen them before. You didn't care to ask them, but... No. I, w I will say this. I I'll share this story. Before you share this story, I want to ask one question to get okay. back to that story. Okay. Do you feel like sometimes that was a gift and a curse? Yes, it was. Both. Okay. It was both. That's why I want... You can share the story, but I had to ask that both. because it's like everybody knows me, but I don't want everybody to know me because I don't want everybody... In my, you know what I mean? It's that... Mm-hmm. Because I'm quite sure that red carpet was constantly laid out in Harlem. Yeah, there was a lot of establishments I never paid to get in. Right. You know, um, once I met, you know, people on my journey, and um, once they found out who my father was, till this day, like if I tell somebody who I am or whatever, they'd be like, oh, they'd give me, salute me, you know, whatever the case may be. And I, I love it. But I, I'm, and I not, hated I'm, not big, I'm not big head with that. Right, because some people would use it to their advantage and run with that it. That wasn't me. That you was you were more me. or less, it's cool. Yeah. That's how I am. It's cool. Yeah. Very laid back, low key. Um, I, was, I, was, I was in the street, but I wasn't in the street. Exactly. You understand what I'm saying? I understand. Yeah, I was in the street. For those that don't understand, one foot in, one foot out. Yeah. And I, learned, I knew what was going on, and I was privy to my surroundings, but I wasn't out there like that. And you wasn't using the name to be a bully. No, never that. I, ne I never, you know, I never really took that from you. Like, you know, some of you, you know, you know who my, no. or you know who my father is. Don't put, I don't feel like that was your, your angle. Your, no, you know what I mean? Never, that was never me. Let's take us to that spot that you, we were just about to touch on. <laughs> we have to go there because um, the culture... This is it. I, although I shared a lot of stories in my book, if it wasn't for Willie, um, there's still a lot of stories that I didn't share um, because there were certain things I didn't want to put in the book. So there were certain things that in my journal, that were in my journal. Your journal is your journal. That's exactly. your, your, your life, your heart. You letting things out that nobody know about that was sacred. So I, I, I left a lot of things out. But I do remember distinctly a cousin of mine, she called me one day and said, hey, I met this guy, I want to bring about a house, you know. So I was like, all right, come through. She came to Jersey and she brought the guy inside and they came upstairs and they sat in the kitchen. So I was in the kitchen cooking at the time. And um, he, he said, can I use the bathroom? So I was like, okay. I told him where the bathroom was down the hallway. For those who have ever been in my house, right outside the kitchen, there was a big picture of my father standing next to a limousine because he also had a limousine service. Wow. And the guy just happened to look up and he saw the picture and he said, wait a minute, is that? Mr. Willie? And I said, yes, that's my father. He said, this is Willie House? And I said, yes. He said, yo, we got to go. He didn't even go to the bathroom. Let me finish. So, you know, he was like, and I said, what's going on? He was like, I'm going to just say this. He said, I gamble with your father. And I know that he would not want me in his house on where he lived. 
So out of respect for your father, I'm gonna leave. He told my cousin to come with me or you can stay here. He said, but I'm out. It was no, he said, there's no, no, no bad. It was respect. It was the respect. And, and that's, that's when I'm standing in the kitchen and I'm looking like, wow, this guy was, he was dead serious and he left. He took her with him. I said, you might as well go on back with him. I said, we'll talk later. I said, it's a learning curve. We, we don't know who my father knows. We don't right. know. We don't know. So they left. And me and her discussed it later on. And that's when we was like, wow, he's everywhere. Everybody knows him. So I always had to. Be mindful of that, too. Yeah, be mindful of my surroundings, who I was with. And he always used to tell me um, if I was if he ever saw me with someone that he didn't feel that I should be around, he would pull me aside. That was very rare, though. But he would also tell me when I first started hanging out in New York, he, he, he name dropped some people and told me just stay away from those people. Um, I didn't ask him why. I just knew that his word was his word. Right. And so, there was a reason behind it. And, and there word. was a reason behind it and you didn't question him. So I just made sure that if I heard those names or I met those people, it was just, you know, how you doing? And I kept it at that. And I think he did that because there's things that he knew as being in the street that I didn't know and I wasn't privy to. And he didn't want me to get involved in that or right. get, get down with that or, you know. Just didn't he even want you to, he that. kept, yeah, he kept you away from all that. Yes. Now, you say you have the siblings. Yes. In the household. How was it? I know everybody had a different relationship. Yeah. yeah did that ever like did that ever bother you know, did that ever you guys being that you got a different relationship with your father, did y'all have a different relationship with each other? Yes, we did. Okay. We don't always get along. Of course, I got a sister. And to the day, we still don't always get along. But I love my siblings. I'm there for them. Of I course. ride a die for them. Right. Um, but you know, that's that's you know, that's that's family. Right. You know, it's not always going to be a kumbaya, you know, but I'm there when you need me. All you got to do is give me a call. Right. I don't care what day, time, or night it is, I'm there. That's, that's the sibling I am. Right. Even with my stepsisters, I'm, I'm like that. And I wouldn't even say I'm, I'm at the age where it's no longer that I should call them stepsisters. They're my sisters. Right, right. We family. There's no state. Yeah, we it's, family yeah, regardless. We family. we family. Yeah. Now, with all of that going on, it's funny how everybody calls your father Mr. You yes. never really, did you guys ever really notice that? Growing up, like, everybody calls my dad Mr. Some people get called by their first name. I think because, number one, who he was in the street. Number two, he, he was also a lot older. Although my father had a lot of establishments and catered to certain age groups, he was a lot older. He may have, he may have acted younger. Right. Or, or, you know, that's how he felt in his heart. But he was a lot older. Yeah, I, re I remember one day, um, Speaking of Mike Boogie, that is, he's like a brother to me. My father raised him. He's also mentioned in my book. Um, he said that one day him and my father was discussing something and, and um, my f something happened and, and he asked him, why did you do that? And my father looked at him and said, nigga, I'm old. Do you realize how old I am? I'm getting old. You know, so he said at that point, that's when he kind of looked at him different, like, yeah, he is getting older, you know? Well, he's not, he's not as sharp as he used to right. be. So, you know, it comes a time in life where you have that come to Jesus moment. Right. Where that light bulb go off. And your dad did a lot of running. Let's be yeah, clear, your father did a lot of running. Yes. Like, so definitely that wear and tear. Family man, street man, business owner always constantly with his mind racing 100 miles and all, always coming up with new ideas, mm -hmm. trying, 
always got to keep one eye open for the snakes. Mm -hmm. Got to keep my eyes on my family. That that had to be a lot for just even your moms. Yeah. I talk about that in my book also. Right. I go there. Right. When I tell you I go there in that book, I go there in that book. Um, the timing of the book. You think it was the right time or you think you could have maybe dropped it earlier? Because timing is everything. I could have dropped it years ago, but I, I, I wasn't ready years ago. Mm. It's like I was in and out. I had a journal. I knew I was writing in my journal, but I didn't know if I was ready to release it to the world. Did you ever think that you would really write a book, though? Or no. Sometimes you no. think, well, you know what? Well, I'm see, this is where me and my father are a lot alike. Even when he started Willie's Burgers, right? He used to cook. Um, he, had, he had a spot and, um, in the basement of the spot where he, he had a live band that used to play. Um, and uh, they used to go downstairs and they used to chill out. That's where they call it the man's cave. That's right. where, that's what, um, one of the guys say in the book that, that was interviewed, it was like called the man cave. And he used to make burgers for everybody. He always wanted to feed everybody. And um, somebody said to him, well, you should open a burger stand. You, these burgers are good. You should open up a burger joint. So the light bulb went off. So he went driving around, he found a spot, and that's when he wanted to build him a burger spot. Now, what was ironic was, I, I, I asked him, why don't you want it to be a restaurant where people sit down? He said, no, no, no. You don't have no walk-up windows. We don't have the, a lot of that. Where somebody walk up to a window, get their burger. He said, I just want them to go get their food and get out of here. But that's not what happened. It started out that way. But then as the night progressed, when it started getting dark, that was the hangout. That was that the, was the iconic stage. spot. That was the stage. I posted, you know, on my IG this morning for the coach, and now you understand why, you know what I mean, I did what I did this morning for my people that follow me. I posted the picture of Willie's with all the cars in the front, and I put the stage on it. Mm -hmm. And I also posted the picture of the thing that you sent me with the guy handcrafting the Willie Burgers. Mm -hmm. Just to let everybody know, I'm setting the stage for the day. My this is what today is going to be. My about. man Danny Cortez right. did that. I and, I, that. and I think he did that also because he knew about this that's, event. Th that's what I'm, that's crazy that he did that, but it's also crazy how the impact of that in and out burger stand affected the lives of people. Yes. Like yeah. we don't, you don't have that anymore. You don't have, yo, listen, this is where I got to be. This is where I have to be a part of. Mm -hmm. Like you want to be a part. Listen, I, we, me and my crew, my partner, I got with me, Coley, we didn't have a car. <laughs> but I got to get the Willie so we can sit in front of that Willie, that burger spot, them two fire hydrants. I'm going to eat my burger and my fries, get my half and half, just to say I was there. And for them to put it in the movie, paid in full, which that basically is that era. Yeah. Our younger culture just sees it as a movie. They don't understand this was a real life situation. Yeah. You were behind that. Willie Burger stand. Mm -hmm. My question to you is, and I got to ask this, how many grills did you have back there? One. Lord have mercy. And that little stand, inside that little stand, and I discussed that in my book also, that stand was so tight. It could only fit about four or five people max. And you couldn't do a whole bunch of turning. We also had an air conditioner in there. He also kept the side and door open. he also had a bathroom in there. Well, of course. But I was freaking out when I saw the bathroom because I'm like, how do you build a bathroom in this small hamburger stand that's off the wall from a corner? And when I tell you he's creative, he was, he, he was a beast you with You mean to tell hand. me I had one grill? One grill. Shoving out all them burnt. One grill. And you know what the thing that your father kept it basic. He didn't go try to get this and get that. You know, people start something, they start it, and they want to add on. Mm -hmm. He just really kept it tinfoil, mm -hmm. your burgers, mm -hmm. your cheese, 
your half and halves. Who started the half and half? My father. My father started that, and I discussed that in the book also. It happened out of a it mistake. Was just, not a mistake, but he, my father loves iced tea, and he like homemade iced tea. You gotta boil the tea bag. That's what I'm trying to say. And 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 we didn't have time to do that in the hamburger stand, so we you know we we had our iced tea and lemonade, but it wasn't together. So one day. My father wanted some iced tea, but my sister was just finishing up um, fixing a new five-gallon, you know, jug of it. So he wanted some lemonade. So we gave him lemonade instead. So then once it was done and we put it back up on the, on the shelf, then he said, put some iced tea in here now. So we put the iced tea in there. He put the lid on and he said, this ain't bad. He said, okay, so we, we gonna start selling, we gonna call it a half and half. Like he made a joke out of it. My father right. was a jokester. Right. So he said, we gonna call it a half and half. So that's how we started the half and half. So we had to introduce it to the customers as they would come to the yeah, window. Yeah, would you like to drink? You know, when we would tell them, you want to mix a half and half, a half lemonade, half iced tea? And they would say, yeah. And that's how we started that half and half thing. The first, the very first. Yeah, I think that, I think, I think he created that. I would, I would, I would definitely co-sign that. Yeah. Because now everywhere half and half. Yeah. And that's amazing, it started back then. And the thing about it is, it started in a burger joint, but people be like, yo, I gotta go to Willie's and get that half and half. Mm -hmm. Yo, I'm in, Jer I'm in Jersey, like, yo, we going to Willie's, they get that half and half. Mm -hmm. I'm, in, I I'm in the Bronx. Yo, you, when you stop through Harlem, give me, stop at Willie's. When I, I'm going to Queens, this time I went to Queens. Yo, you going, yo, you going to stop it in Harlem? <laughs> like, it's crazy how iconic that one place just gave everybody so much life. Mm -hmm. And we don't, we don't have that going on now. Let's be clear, no. that's not going on. No. People he, come and go, yeah. people dance around, but they don't leave that imprint. Mm -hmm. Like your father's, Willie Burger's imprint, the rooftop, the s, &S the Willie's Lounge is like the memorial of the rink. Mm -hmm. Like those things that people will talk about that to the day, psh, come on, like, come on, the, the rooftop had the recording studio in there. Yeah, it was upstairs. What, what, you know, what would make your father say, hey, I'm gonna start that, you know what I mean? That, I got a cl social club. That was built for Teddy Riley. Mm. He built that for Teddy Riley. Which he started out in the band that my father had. Um, Cause he had a live jazz band that used to play. Right. And um, that's, that's mentioned and discussed in my book also. Um, and they they needed a manager and um he they didn't like the spot where they were practicing and he gave them a spot to practice um and they went to him as a group and asked him to be their manager and he was like i don't want to be no manager no no band so they was like you know we we need a manager right so he said he'll take a stab at it and he took a stab at it and he was the best from what they're telling me, because I wasn't there. Right. From what Daryl and the rest of the group is telling me, he was the best manager that they had for Total Climax. The name of the group was Total Climax. They said he was the best manager that they ever had. You know, he, he took care of them like they were his sons, all of them. Well, once again, I go your father being the father figure mm -hmm. to so many. Mm -hmm. And let's be clear, your father also birthed a lot of people. Like, he gave so many people the opportunity to get to where they at today mm -hmm. through your father that a lot of people sometimes don't even pay homage about that about. Yeah. Because, it, like you said, if it wasn't for Willie, a lot of Harlem would be lost. Yeah, I, would, I wouldn't say that, but he was the... He was the core... One, one thing I will say... He never wanted to open up a business outside of Harlem. And I asked him that, why don't you, why don't you open up a, a burger joint in the Bronx? Or he said, no, I want all of my businesses to be in Harlem. In the radius of each other too. And I said, and I asked him why. He said, because that's, 
this is where my heart is. This is where I'm from. And he said, and if something jump off, I'm going to find out about it. Because that's just how the culture was. Yeah, that's true. So he wanted to keep it within a certain range. So he only Can keep his up. hands. There you go. He wanted to keep it in Harlem. So, you know, even though we had Willie Burgers on 145th Street, he decided later on to open up another one on 125th Street that was not far from m and G's. Right. And um, a lot of people did go to that one also, um, but it wasn't as popular. Yeah, it wasn't as, 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 one it on wasn't as effective. It wasn't as effective. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So your father, basically, I had an argument with a cat a couple of weeks ago, and I'm like, yo, my man, Willie's was the first Jimbo's. It wouldn't be it Jimbo's. Was, it was. It was. It wouldn't be no Jimbo's if it wasn't for Willie Burgers. Yeah. He's like, yo, I see you my man. You don't understand. You know what I'm saying? I said, you'll never understand, but let's just leave that where it's at because now we, oh, dude. You know how that whole argument mm -hmm. debate starts to go. You know what I'm saying? Now, time progress. Your father's getting older. Mm-hmm. Y'all adults. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, life, the journey. As you see things start to slow down a little bit, is anybody striving to dive in to take over or everybody's kind of like well let's just say this you know what a lot of people don't understand is when you have a business like that that's open 24 hours we didn't ask for that hamburger stand but that hamburger stand fed us that hamburger stand paid our bills right that hamburger stand helped put me through school bought our cars did a lot of things for people um, so we were a part of it and at some point when he got older and he felt that he couldn't handle it anymore, what he decided to do was pass it down to my brother and my brother was running the hamburger stand. Okay. So. About um, what year was this? Just uh, for the yeah, culture anyway, to get it under. Yes, and nah, nah, I can't, I would say in the. Just, I mean, nineties. In the 90s, okay. somewhere in the... Early 90s? No, when he decided to pass it down to my brother, it had to be, yeah, about the 90s. Yeah. Something like that. And um, my brother was running it after that. I went away to school. Um, my sister was working, so my brother was the one that was running the hamburger stand. How long did y'all have... How long did your father have each location? Do you know? I would have to sit down and think about that. Okay. I can't tell you that off the top of my right. head. Um, but Willie's was the longest out of all of them. Out Willie's of all Burgers of them. was okay. the longest out of all of them. I, I That's why I asked that because I, mm -hmm. that run was an extended mm -hmm. run. Yeah. That never really lost a beat. No. At no, all. Never lost a beat. Because y'all made burgers. Yeah. And it was no, you know, special sauce, lettuce, cheese to the situation. And, and, and that's what everybody wanted. When you come in home from work, you walk by, get a burger. When you, when you come Going from to the work, club. Yeah. Taking it to lunch. Yeah. When you came, from, when you coming home from a club, you stop, you got a burger. Um, when you, you know, it, it was a nonstop It was shot. a lunch. And, and with me and my little crew, big shout out to J-Rock. Me and my, my friend, my best friend, J-Rock. Um, that was our stop. Like, you know, we hopped around, went to many clubs. But we always knew that we had a spot that we had, could go to and get some food. And we had to pay. You know? If you was with me, you was with me. Right. I had you. You right. didn't have to pay for nothing. Right. So... You know, I made sure that, that that was taken care of. So me and Jay Rock used to always laugh about that, that that was a one-stop shop. And we would stop there in between running the street, get our little eat on, and then leave there and go wherever else we was going. Then come back, you know. Do it again. That, yep, that was my thing. And, and in between there, I ain't gonna lie, I used to take money out of the cash register. So after a while, I was banned from the hamburger stand. <laughs> Of course, he banned me after a while. He was like, don't let her in here. Don't give her nothing or I'm going to fire you. So it was serious. It was serious. It was serious. It was serious. Well, that was just your pops being your pops. Yeah, yeah. And you being... It only happened for a little while. Right, of course. That's not going to last forever. <laughs> and the crazy thing about it is what made it also so iconic, it was ground beef. It, was, it wasn't no that frozen shit. 
No. Y'all, y'all, y'all in there making patties. It was a top of the line ground beef. And how that started, um, which is also mentioned in my book. So I'm going to keep directing. As you should, direct- because the culture needs to pick up this book. To my book, because that the book is the heart of all of this. Right. Um, in the building that we lived in in Harlem, there was a, a, my father be, befriended a, a family. Well, well, several families we were cool with in the building, but he had one friend in the building, and his name was Mr. Wright. So shout out to Mr. Wright and his family. Um, and when my father went to jail, when he came home, Mr. Wright had opened up a meat market. He had his own meat market mm. over there um, called um, Smitty's Meats. It was over there by the Cotton Club. Okay. And um, he had his own meat market, so of course he gonna make sure his friend had the top of the line meat. So we had a, we had the top of the line ground beef. We put nothing in the meat. So I used to really laugh when I saw a lot of stuff on YouTube. People talking about Willie Burgers and the secret sauce. There was no secret sauce. It was just the ground beef was so good. And we toasted the buns. Yes. You know, that was the difference between us and other burgers. We toasted the buns. Back then, nobody, you had to ask. No, we toasted the buns. And um, we, we, we were known also for our cooked onions. Yes. And we only had the half and half. We didn't sell water, sodas. Nah. It was either you get the half and half or you go to the corner store. Which was literally a spin. Yeah. And, the, and speaking of the corner store, they were like family to us also. Of course, it had to be. Yeah. They were like family. We, we had a tab in the, in the corner store. I'm sure My you did. My father had a tab in the corner store. I'm sure he so did. So I used to add to it. Of course. Every now and then. Because you knew it was there and it was convenient. Yeah. And we're going to do what we're going to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, it's funny how, you know, one place can change a whole era. You know, and that's why this interview for me personally was very, it touched home. Mm-hmm. Because I know what that did. And to see these guys now put, relive it, me being a, a father of, of young kids that's racing, going, oh, I'm going to the city, Dad. Yo, you going to New York. It's water. I call New York watered down now. You know what I mean? It's, I say, yo, you going, you going over the water. You can call it the water because it's watered down. <laughs> I said, because you'll never find a space, you'll never have a place where you could just go stand there. Mm-hmm. and just enjoy your whole evening. Mm-hmm. And you know that it wasn't just Willie's. We'd go from Willie's to 125th Street and stand in front, standing on 125th Street. Like, those things, what it brought to the, to the community, mm-hmm. what it brought to the different culture, mm-hmm. what it brought to the legacy. Mm-hmm. Because now you're sitting here, got the Willie Burgers fitted on, you got the Willie Burgers merch, shirts. Let's talk about that too. You dived into the merch game. Well, it was kind of fell in my lap. Let's just say that. Okay. It kind of fell in my lap. Can we talk about it for a I little had, bit? I, I, had an, I had an idea. Here I go, a thinker, like Your my father. dad. Um, but I didn't know how to execute it. Um, so I discussed it with um, some friends. Okay. And, the, and, and we were supposed to go into business. Right. Um, long story short, before I go into business, I'm going to make sure that I dot my I's and cross my T's. So I guess I took a little too long to, to come up with, um, my paperwork, you know, for everybody to sign to make sure it was legit. So they backed out. So I decided to move on by myself, but I did it at my leisure at my time. Right. So that's how that was created. But the name Brewington Cloth um, came from a friend also. Um, Not to cut you off, but it's very, I got to salute you to the family for always keeping the name. Yes. Yeah, I, the name just is, so you'll never get John. It's not like we're going to call it, we're going to give it, we're giving you our name, Willie Brewington. Mm-hmm. Bluenton Crawl, Willie my, Burgess. My last name is is not is very unique. It's not something that you hear every day. And I'm not, even down with. It sounds the, a little uppity too. The Bluentons. I'm even down with the Bluenton 
um, group on Facebook. Okay. Yeah, we're all over the place now. Okay. Yeah, we're we're talking about having a reunion and stuff now. As you should. Yeah. So um, as we see somebody with the name, they come in, they join the the group. It's a family. On Facebook, it's a family. Um, my ancestors, from what I know, were Indians, and they used to brew beer. Mm. And um, that's where the name Brewington comes from. So your your whole family just has the hustle. Yeah, They've Native Indians. Yeah. Native Indian hustle, grind. We gonna go do what we need to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You did the clothing. You started out with the merch. It's 2023. I'm seeing you at a lot of different car shows. Yes. That started with um, Rich Red. Shout out to Rich Red. Rich Reg and the BBS boys. Shout out to you guys. Shout out to I the love BBS you. boys. Um, he reached out to a mutual friend that we have, and he wanted to have a car show, and he wanted to have a paid in full type of theme, and he wanted Willie Burgers there. So the mutual friend said, that's my girl. I know T. I can get in touch with her. So that's how that started. So Rich Reg was the one to start that. And um, when he contacted me, he thought that we still had the food truck. But I, I told him to we that. didn't have it. I was get we didn't that. have it anymore. So he said, so what? Let's do a cookout style. Can we do that? I said, I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to make it happen. So, so that's how that started. Um, it was last minute. It was like two weeks I had to get everything together. Um, what I did was thinking outside of the box. I got it. I still keep in touch with the Willie Burgers family. A lot of the shout out to them. A lot of the co-workers that used to work there. And um, I got one of the original chefs. His name is Anthony. Um, and um, he wasn't a chef back then. He just needed a job to feed his family. So he started out, we also had a restaurant next door to the hamburger stand. And he used to work in there. He started out in there. And then he moved over to the, he wanted to flip burgers. So they tried him out, put him in the hamburger stand. So he was flipping burgers. And people sleep on Anthony because Anthony's like, a, he's not a huge guy. Right. He's a little short guy. guy, little guy. Slim guy. Yeah. And, um, but he was a beast on that grill. So, um, and he, me and him talk about that today. He said that he became a chef after he left Willie's. He became a chef, and he said he wouldn't be the chef he is today if it wasn't for Willie's. It goes right back if yeah. it wasn't for Willie again. Yeah. So everything, everything, everything comes back around full circle. Yes, yes. I could go on for days with the if it wasn't for Willie's stories. So there, there, there was a young lady who contacted me. I don't know if it was on Facebook or Instagram, and she said that my father walked up to her one day and told her, you too pretty to be on the street, in the street, like late night. Right. And she said she was mad at him. She never liked him after he said that to her. But she said years later, she got it. She got the message of what he was really trying to tell her. Right. And she said that she always wanted to thank him because she said if he wouldn't have never said that to her, I don't think she would have really realized Understood the direction what she was she going was in. in. So she said that by him saying that to her, it kind of made her look at her herself a different way, I guess, and she changed her direction and what she was doing. And um, that was cool to hear that story. And I, I don't know, I don't know this young lady. Once again, your father being that father figure, that extension. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I'm going to play a word game with you, two words. And I just want to um, tell me what you think of these words. Willie Bruinton. He was a father. He was an entrepreneur. He was a businessman. He was a manager. He was a father to many. He was a confidant. 
Okay. And he was, and he was, the first love I ever had. Yeah, and 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 you know why I had? That's why I asked you that. That's why I asked you that in particular. Now, my second word to you, because your whole life you've been surrounded around this, outside of this, inside of this family, because really you have a big family. If you really want to be honest. Yes, I do, and I and I will. Yeah, a lot be, of extension I, cords. Yes, and I will be family. honest and say this. I have siblings out there that I don't even know about. I know I do. Right. You know, let's just keep it real. Um, what I can say to you if you're watching this video is if you want to know about your dad, read my book, If It Wasn't For Willie. If you want to reach out to me, reach out. I can't say that we're 100% related without taking the DNA. Of course, we're not just taking on somebody that's no, saying, hey, we're not doing it. No, we ain't taking on somebody just don't right. just, trying, off just trying street. to get in the building, Never trying that. to catch the train. Because, <laughs> you know, the glory train is going is running already, so, you know what I mean? But yeah, I just, let's clear that part up. Right, you know what but I mean? But if, if you want to know about him, then purchase my book. If you want to know how Willie Burger started, purchase the book, if it wasn't for Willie. If you want to know the type of person he was, as a child of his earlier years, read the book. If you want to know about people he helped, what I also addressed in the book when, during the interviews um, that the ghostwriter, when she interviewed certain people, they spoke about what he did for them and where they are now. And the stories are awesome. They're all different. Your father was a teacher, though. Yes, he, he was. He was a teacher, too. Yeah. And, and I, I don't think that he knew what his... Calling, calling was? was. I don't think he knew I that. think he did. I think he wanted, he knew he wanted to help. He was a helper. Yeah, that's He that. always wanted to uplift. Yes, Let's be clear. Did. Your father was a man that wanted to uplift the people around him. Yes. And that's very, that's so unique as a black man growing up, coming from the South, moving up to Harlem, mm -hmm. and looking around and saying, you know what, instead of me killing my community or trying to destroy my community, I'm going to bring up my community. There was a, 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 a good, there's a good friend of mine that told me that he witnessed himself. There was, I guess, a beef between two guys or whatever, and they were about to really kill each other. And my father intervened, put his life at risk, and got in between them. And he spoke to both of them, and he got them to dead that beef that they had. He said, I witnessed He knew this the bigger with picture. My, with he, my he own knew. Eyes. Your father was a visionary. He knew where it was going to lead to. Mm -hmm. And he had so much love for each party that he said, you know, we're not going to allow this to happen. Yeah, that's, he wasn't a man of confusion. He wasn't a, he wasn't a troublemaker, you know? He wasn't a bully. He wasn't a bully. He was never that. He took care of bullies. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know? Um, I think he might despise bullies, truthfully. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because he didn't come from that. We we not we gonna do it the right way. We not gonna strong arm to get to where we gotta go. Mm -hmm. We gonna do it the right way. Mm -hmm. I got one other word I just thought about. I know I said two, but I gotta give you three. Legendary and legacy. You can choose either one, but legendary. And I say legacy because here we are today talking about the legacy. And, and let's just. Talk about the legacy for a minute. I'm gonna ride this out until I can't breathe anymore. As you should. That's what I'm gonna do. As you should. That's what I'm gonna do. I think I, think I even owe that to my father because he did a lot for people. He wasn't, he wasn't the type of person that was flashy. He, I did this, I did that. He was never that type of person. When he opened his establishments, he knew that he couldn't do it by himself. So he hired key people to help him run his establishments. As one young man in the book said, my father would hire a crackhead and give him a job. That's just the type of person he was. But you had to prove yourself to him. He didn't just give you no job. Right. You had to prove yourself to him. And once you proved to him that he could trust you, then he would let you, you would you was a part, you of, the was a part of the family and the establishment. Yeah, so he did that for a lot of people. 
When he ate, everybody ate. So, and that's the type of person I am. Mm. So, and I'm going to always live out that legacy until the day that I die. Because I feel that, I feel that I owe that to the culture. You're obligated. Yeah, I feel that. I, I, it's just a part of me. Um, because there's a lot of him in me. And um, that's just the way I am. And that's the way that I, I mean, I can, I, I, I'm even thinking about writing another book. I think you should, I was going to touch I, on I'm that. I'm thinking we, about we, writing another, I already that. have the title in my head. And we should also push this documentary. Yes. Because the culture needs this. And this is the purpose, for people that don't understand, this is the purpose of this whole interview. This is culture. This is not just something that we just, oh, you know, some street shit. This is real life. This was a livelihood. This was something that brought happiness and joy to people. Mm -hmm. This was something we wanted to be a part of. And to, to see it now, years, decades later, I'm 48 years old now, and to see you hop, popping up, you know, at these different car shows, seeing you at Drop, shout out to my man, Corey, you know what I mean, I Drop 100, drop. you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Seeing you there, seeing you a part of what Brothers is trying to do and seeing how important that that stand is. If it wasn't for Willie, mm -hmm. yo, a lot of the culture wouldn't even have the whole paid in full. Pay, it wouldn't be no, I'm gonna say this, it wouldn't be paid in full if it wasn't for Willie's because that was the stage. It was. Your father set a stage. And those were the establishments that they hung out in that were reenacted in the movie. Right. They were all owned by my father. And it had to be there. You had to be somebody or you had to be the biggest hustler. To, you had to be there. Mm-hmm. If you wasn't here, then you wasn't it. If you got fresh, you got the car, whatever you got, the latest gear, I got to go to this spot and let the world see what I'm doing. This mm -hmm. is my stage. Mm -hmm. Your father set the stage for a whole generation of people even to this moment. Yeah. He, was just, he was definitely the key, per, the key player behind the stage. Mm -hmm. He was the director, he was the teacher, he was a father. And that's why I said the legacy. Yeah. And he's so legendary. And you keeping it going on in 2023, seeing you at these different events with a smile on your face, keeping the torch alive. I got to ask, what happened to the food truck? Because this day and time, the food truck game is to the ceiling. And that, y'all started it. Mm-hmm. Can you, do you mind touching on it? I'm gonna I, say that. I'll touch on it. And it's also mentioned in the book. My brother, Eric, came to me and my sister and told us that he was thinking about uh, having Willie's, Willie's Burgers on wheels. I thought it was an awesome idea. Um, I told him, well, he said, well, he gave us each a job. My job was to advertise and get it out there because I'm the one that everybody knows in the street or they think they know me right. and don't know me. I mean, you came through Harlem in different whips, though. I heard some things. Yeah, I did. You, but show, you did a little showing off. I, 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 you did a little showing. Let's stop and cut it, T. You did your, you did I, your showing off. I, I wouldn't say I was showing off. I'm not going well, well, to. These are whips that either I own or my parents own. Exactly, but to the culture at that time, mm -hmm. I'm not going to say that when I say showing off, you didn't do it like, aha, it was more like, this I'm, is what, this is what, this is what we have. This is and, what's and, here. But see, my thing was, I, I was out there, but I was low key. A lot of people still didn't know who I was. They didn't know me. And, and I wanted it to be that way. I wanted you, I always had to watch who, was, who I was around because I didn't know if he was hanging out with me for me. Or hanging out for or the hype. Or hanging out with me. For the hype. Because of who my father was. Yeah, what comes with it. Oh, yeah. I'm with time. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I had an ex-boyfriend tell me that even after we broke up, he used to get an ass and ass and tell him that he was Willie's son-in-law. They ain't even questioning him. They let him in. Of course, because ain't too many brothers just walking up telling you that. Yep. See so what they, I'm saying? They, he told me that years later. They, they would let me in. So um, I wasn't mad at him. You know, but that, that it, it was what it was. Now, let's just touch back before we close this interview out. The truck, you started it. You was going to be Okay, the, let's go back to that. Yeah, because I could jump from story right. to story. So Part two is coming, though, just for the coaches to understand. So don't think we're going to just end off this thing in D.C., but because there's still a lot more that we get. Like I said, the document, get, get into the book. I mean, to the, uh, the truck. <laughs> so, um, my job was to advertise. 
So um, he gave us each a job. So when he started the truck, this was his idea with his wife. Okay. Um, I wasn't a part of the, the truck. I was just, because I knew that it was living on the legend of the name, off my father's name, I had to do my part. Right. I did my part. Shout out to Flex, Funk Master Flex, for really advertising. He was definitely dropping bombs on the on And for inviting us to be the first food vendor to his car show. So that was really how the car show thing, I think, started mm. uh, with, with Flex. I think it started with Flex. The cookout, Willy Burger cookout style thing, that's what started with Rich Ridge. Okay. Um, but Funk Flex was the originator. Um, and he talked about that on his interview also um, about the burgers he liked and, and the culture and the environment, the lifestyle, Once again, the, the whole life, the stage. all of that. The stage. So my brother decided to, to um, get a food truck. So my brother got the food truck from a, a cousin of ours. Big shout out to Cousin Rick. And um, he was going to lease it from him, I guess, until he paid him off. So I, did, I, did, I didn't agree with a lot of things that he, would do, he was doing. Um, and sometimes, as a sibling, it's best to just fall back. Okay. So that's what I did. Okay. I fell back. And I let him do his thing because right. I had nothing to do with that. Exactly. Really. So I let him do him. Um, long story short, he, I don't think he was moving right. He was all over the place. He, okay. he wasn't in major spots where he, I think, should've he should have been, been okay. um, for people to come. And um, I don't think he was making the money like he should have made. Okay. But... Um, I was, you know, being that a lot of people know me. Um, there, there was someone that reached out to me that I do know, and um, he wanted to franchise the trucks. And um, I brought it to my brother's attention. And um, my brother is a man of the word, you know. He, he's he's a pastor now. Okay. He's a, he's preaching the word of God now. Um, and he said that he don't just go on ideas or, or what people want to do. He have to pray on it. Right. And I understood and I that. I respect that. I respected that. Because your plan may not be God's plan. There you go. So he never, he never came back to me with anything. So that kind of just fell by the wayside. But as he progressed, time progressed on, he wasn't making the money like he needed to make to pay the truck off. Right. So eventually... Um, my cousin wanted the truck back, and then somebody else purchased the truck. Okay. So what my brother decided to do was keep the name on the truck, cause, cause even though we don't have the truck, my father's name, they got a name, Willie, Willie's Burgers exactly. is still on the truck. So exactly. people are following that truck, thinking that it's us, but it's not us. Okay. Um, from my understanding, there's a young lady that, that owns the truck. Her name is Tanya, like my name, Tanya. Wow. So a lot of people think that she's me. Right. But I'm here to let the story be told. That's not me. Okay. That's not the original Willie's Burgers family. Okay. So, but I will say this. Whoever goes to that truck, continue to go to them. Continue to buy food from them, purchase them, because what they're also doing is helping me keep my father's legacy alive. That's what I was going to say. I'm not a torches. hater. I never was a hater. Right. George is lit. So my thing is keep going to the truck. Right. But just know that that's not me in that truck. Right. And we appreciate the support from the truck. Yeah. Now, as we close this out, you got any, anything you would like the culture to know as we get ready to close out? Let's speak where they can find the book, they can find the merch. Mm -hmm. um, what's up and coming for you guys? What's up and coming for you? Just give the culture a little bit of something before we close out. Um, where can they find the book at? My, the, my book, if it wasn't for Willie, can be purchased at Barnes & Noble and also Amazon. 
And for those who follow me on Instagram or Facebook, you can hit me up in my DM. I send autographed copies out. Um, my merchandise is um, BrewingtonCloth.com. I'm also on IG and Facebook. Please follow me. Um, and sometimes I'll put things on my business pages for Brewington Cloth, and I don't put it on my personal website. I'm also on IG. My personal um, page is Lil L I L Willie Willie's Burgers. Um, I'm there. I, my page is private. I I do screen people before they come in, um, and not everybody make it in. So just <laughs> to let you know that that's just me. Um, I would say for the future, there's some things that I'm working on that I choose not to disclose. It's just gonna happen uh, when it happened. Um, thank you for everyone who supported, helped keep my father's legacy alive. Thank you for all of my customers who purchased from my website, all of my friends, family, and people that purchased my book. Um, I'm trying to push my book. We and I'm, I, I, yeah. We it, it, it's already being pushed, but this, I hope that this will give it an extra boost. And I'm going to be honest with you, I'm looking for a movie. I want a movie deal. Let's just keep it real. I want a movie deal um, for my book to tell my father's story. And trust me, I have a lot of stories and a lot of people that loved him and that would assist in making this happen. So I'm here. You know how to locate me. You know how to find me. Hit your girl up. Yeah, you heard it first. We here. I mean, it can't get no more epic, no more classic than this. This is the culture. This is the environment. This is, if it wasn't for Willie himself, he birthed. I mean, so many other individuals. He, he was a pillar to our community, to Harlem. He's a father. He was a great man, but he was a trendsetter. And the opportunity to sit with you today, I'm honored. I never got a chance to meet your father personally because I was a little snot nose. But man, what he did for me in my life, in my teenage years, it'll never be forgotten. You know what I mean? I still tell my kids to this day, my era and your era, you'll never understand it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And yo, you know what it is, the voice of the culture. Um, stay tuned. We got something special brewing with Miss Brewington. And um, thank you once again, man. We back. It's the round table. We out here in D.C. You heard it. Go get the book. If it wasn't for Willie, holler at us, man. If you need anything, holler at her. You can holler at me. I will extend the extension cord to her. Go get the book. It's, it's a must read. And um, stay tuned. We got some more greatness coming up from Miss Tanya. Thank you, sweetie. Appreciate you. You're welcome. And before we go, can I um, give some people a shout out? Of course. I want to give um, certain people a shout out that I know is a part of my journey in my book. And that's Naomi, who spoke about Willie's Lounge. And that's Anthony, who was always with me with being the chef at my cookouts. Big shout out to Anthony. Big shout out to Mike Boogie and Hollingsworth Souls, cause he's doing big things now. He has his own clothing line. Big shout out to you, Boogie. I love you to death. Big shout out to Daryl, the Total Climax Band. Big shout out to all of the DJs. We forgot about the DJs. Come on. My father had all of the hottest DJs in his establishments. Big shout out. I, I, I want to know, I don't remember everybody's name off the top of my dome. Come on. Bruce but e. I B, will say the this. world famous. Brucey e. B. The world Mike, famous. Brucey e. B, Mike Spot. Star Child, God bless the dead. Lovebug Starsky, God bless That's the, the dead. dead. Carlton. Hollywood. Psh, the list goes on. Big E. B. Whew. You name it, they were in the house. And if they wasn't in the house, then they wasn't going and they wasn't gonna be no place else. Let's big, be clear. Yes. Big shout out to DJ Double J. Double J was one of the DJs at Willie's Lounge. A lot of people didn't know that. Double J was doing his thing way back then. Um and um I 
I love every one of you. If I miss someone's name, I apologize. But you know who you are. Um, I'm a little nervous, but this, this is going to wrap this up. But there's more to come, especially from me. Well, you heard it first, y'all. It's the round table. If it wasn't for Willie, Miss Tanya, DC, I appreciate y'all. I'm out of here, the voice of the culture. Peace. Later.